Welcome to Studies with Stearman. Join us as we look deeper into the Bible. Strengthen your faith with us, even as we see the day approaching. And now, here's Gary. What we're doing in this study is attempting to recognize a pattern that runs throughout Scripture. Last week we looked at Revelation chapter 6, and in Revelation chapter 6, you have the opening of the first six seals. And remember what the seals are. They are the seals on an indictment against planet Earth. And when the Lord opens those seals, He's acting as the judge. He's acting in judgment. The first seals bring forth the four horsemen of the Apocalypse and the Antichrist. Last week we spent quite a bit of time talking about the fact that as He first rides forth, He's the Prince. He's not the king. But then, as you see his later development, the book of Daniel, which we also looked at, Daniel chapter 11, he's called the king as he rises to power. So there are stages in the development of the Antichrist which we're going to look at. The church is going to be taken out at a certain point prior to what we read that is commonly known in the Old Testament as the latter days. We're going to study that term to a degree. Revelation chapter 6, first seal, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him had a bow, a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That crown is in the Greek Stephanos, not Diotima. It's a crown of a victor. It's a crown traditionally reserved for an athletic victor or in the case of the Caesars, the Caesars wore the little Stephanos crown. If you see the statue of Julius Caesar in Rome today, it'll have the little olive leaf crown on it, which is symbolic of victory. We start out with the Antichrist participating or being elevated to power in military victory. And we pointed out last week that when you open those first five seals, one is the Antichrist, two is war, three is financial instability, four is death, and I take it that would include things like chemical, biological warfare, nuclear death, death from disease, hunger, because Jesus said there will be global famines during this period. The fifth seal has the saints under the altar saying, How long, O Lord? And remember last week, it's interesting that the saints under the altar at the fifth seal are still saying, How long, O Lord, until you judge the enemy? Which means he hasn't started to judge yet. So it is my contention that the first five seals are pre-tribulational. Before the tribulation, the sixth seal then opens a whole new series of seals and you have the sun becoming black as sackcloth of hair, the moon as blood. And you remember what Joel said in Joel 2.10 and 2.28. He said, the sun's going to be affected, the moon's going to be affected before the great and terrible day of the Lord. So we're still talking pre-tribulational right up until the end of chapter 6 in Revelation where you have the kings of the earth, the great, the rich, the mighty, the leaders of the earth hiding themselves under the ground, in the dens, as the Bible says, in the rocks of the mountains. And in great fear, they declare, the day of His wrath is come. So now, right at the opening of the sixth seal, you find a transition. And then, at this point, you have, at last, come to the day called in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord, called the day of Christ. It is the day that Jesus referred to as the tribulation, the great one, and it happens by degrees. That's the point that I want to make. We went back to Daniel 11. Again, I want to review this very quickly before we really get deeply into what we're going to be studying this morning. Daniel chapter 11 talks about the Antichrist as king, not as prince. Remember, Daniel chapter 9 speaks of the coming prince. Daniel chapter 11 talks about the king. Daniel chapter 11, verse 36, The king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself, magnify himself above every god, and speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper until the indignation be accomplished. Now that indignation is the tribulation or the day of the Lord, or the time of judgment. 
And so here, as we look at him as king, this, I believe, is a later time than we look at in Revelation. Revelation 6, he rides forth, and the Greek there says conquering with the intention to further conquer. He's going forth to expand his empire, in other words. Here, we see him farther along. He's called the king. He does according to his own will. He exalts himself. He magnifies himself above every god. He speaks marvelous things against the god of gods, and he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. And so the willful king comes to power before the tribulation. And we looked at Daniel 11, 36 through 45 last week, and we noticed that even after he comes to power, or as he comes to power, he is opposed by the king of the north, the king of the east. And then again, the king of the east and the king of the north come against him twice in that passage of Scripture. And the last time we see in verse 44 of Daniel 11, but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with a great fury to destroy and utterly sweep away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, none shall help him. And that's where we left off last week. The idea being that the Antichrist does not just say, hello, here I am, I am the Antichrist. He doesn't just do that one day. He goes through a series of stages in which he makes a name for himself, and he makes a name for himself in a series of battles. The only battle, until you get to the Battle of Armageddon in Revelation chapter 19, the only battle that is recognizable from many perspectives is the battle that we normally think of as the Battle of Gog of the land of Magog in Ezekiel 38. And I believe that that battle the battle of Gog in Ezekiel 38 is the same battle seen at the four horsemen of the apocalypse. It is the same battle seen here in Daniel chapter 11 as he does various kinds of battle until he culminates his power by planting his tabernacles, his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. That would be Mount Zion or Jerusalem. He makes that his capital. He does all this, and this is the final important point before we go on. In verse 39, his rise to power is described, Daniel 11:39. thus shall he do in the most strongholds, that is, he's going to capture the vaults of power, the global track, the global keys to power. He will attain with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. Now, this strange God in Scripture is called an alien God. If you just look at the Hebrew for what the King James calls strange, the word is nakar in Hebrew, which means alien. An alien, meaning it could refer to a foreigner, somebody who comes in town who doesn't speak your language. But nakar is the Hebrew word for alien. And in verse 39, thus shall he do in the most strong holds with an alien God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. So Antichrist's power, that is the key to his power in the upper strata of political control, is this alien God whom he acknowledges. Now from that we know one thing for sure, the church is gone at this point. When the Antichrist rises up and acknowledges this alien God, that tells us the church is not in the world anymore because the church is the great restraining force. In the New Testament, Paul says that the restrainer will continue to restrain until he be taken out of the way, and then all of this can happen and not before. So what Daniel tells us, what Revelation tells us, is that a certain series of things has to happen in order before this man can stand up and really take power, which he does with the backing of this alien God. Now, this is very strange. We're not accustomed to thinking of things like this. In the 20th and 21st centuries, you know, and now we're postmodern and we're cool and hip and we've got all kinds of computers and stuff, and we don't think about alien gods. Well, a lot of us don't, but I think they're at the door. The old gods and some new ones are getting ready to pop out again, and the only thing that's keeping that from happening is the presence of the church. 
Now, with all of this in mind, we're going to study the prophet Zechariah. So turn over to Zechariah, and we're going to look at Zechariah 11. And again, we're going to study a series of events, a sequence of events in Zechariah's prophecy. You have in Zechariah chapter 11, the rejection of the Messiah when he came. Zechariah actually talks about the first coming of Jesus all the way through his prophecy. Chapters 9, 10, chapter 11 talks about how they rejected the Messiah. And the Messiah is likened to a shepherd. His flock, the people of Israel, are cast away in chapter 11. The shepherds are gone, and Judah and Israel are cut loose, and they are cast to the four corners of the world. In Zechariah 11, 14, um, let's start back here in 12. Zechariah 11, verse 12. And I said unto them, if you think good, give me my price, and if not, forbear. So they weighed for my price 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said unto me, Cast it to the potter, a goodly price that I was prized at of them. In other words, that's a fair price, a fair market value. Silver, by the way, in the Old Testament is called the metal of redemption. Silver was very strongly and figuratively used in the construction of the tabernacle. For example, the sockets of the tabernacle were made of silver. And silver is the symbol of redemption, or the price of redemption. And 30, 3 times 10, is a number associated with the tabernacle and associated with redemption. And so here they're talking about the price of the rejection of the Messiah. And the Lord said, cast it to the potter. Goodly price I was prized at of them. And I took the 30 pieces of silver, cast them to the potter in the house of the Lord, then I cut asunder my other staff, even bands, or bindings, that I might break the brotherhood between Judah and Israel. The Lord said unto me, Take unto thee yet the instruments of a foolish shepherd. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land, which shall not visit those that be cut off. Neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. But he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Well, this is a prophecy, and I know you grasp the significance of this, the prophecy of the Antichrist, the false shepherd, who comes to his people in the latter days. Notice he comes in the wake of the price having been paid. Now, who paid the price? Israel paid the price. Who took the money? Judas took the money. 30 pieces of silver. And it was the price of the false redemption of the house of David. There are only two people in the entire Bible that are likened to each other, and they are the Antichrist and Judas. Judas and the Antichrist have so much in common, it's just amazing. They have things in common, for example, in their view of the world. The Antichrist, if you really look at what he's doing, as he rises to power, he's promising people that he will give them their fair share of the product of the earth. If you look at what Judas does while he's alive among the disciples, Judas is very concerned constantly about the treasury, about money. Judas is preoccupied with money. That's kind of what makes his little world tick. He was the treasurer among the disciples. The Antichrist is preoccupied with money, mark of the beast. And so you have a real close correlation between Judas and the Antichrist. And here you have Zechariah writing. And Zechariah is talking about the price of the false redemption in the same breath as he's talking about the idle shepherd. Now, if you look at John, hold your place there, and go forward to John 10, Jesus has a discourse on the shepherd. John chapter 10, where he calls himself the good shepherd. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door of the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. 
And Jesus begins a discourse in which he calls himself the shepherd. And if you go down here to John 10.10, 10, the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. I'm come that they might have life, they might have it more abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. But he that is an hireling and not the shepherd, whose own sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catches them and scattereth the sheep. So Jesus is saying, I'm the true shepherd. I'm not a hired shepherd. I'm not a shepherd for hire. So the figure of the Antichrist is that of a shepherd for hire. In other words, his motivation is money. Jesus' motivation was not monetary. The false shepherd will be motivated by money. Judas was motivated by money. The Antichrist is going to be motivated by money. And in the prophecy of Zechariah, you have the figure of the 30 pieces of silver followed by the idle shepherd whose right eye and his right arm are crippled. Now, isn't that interesting? Who does that remind you of? Reminds you of the Antichrist in the New Testament, right? See, Antichrist in the New Testament is given a deadly wound that is miraculously healed. The beast that rises up in the last days, he's a composite beast. He's a global beast, if you will. He's like a leopard, his feet like the feet of a bear, his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gives him his power and his seat and great authority. That's that strange or alien god. The dragon gives him his authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and the deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. So I take it literally. I take it that at some point the Antichrist is going to be, and this is during his rise to power, he's going to be wounded physically, and he's going to be miraculously healed by this alien power behind him. And when he is, that will certify to the world that he is the chosen one, that he will pose as the Messiah. Later he'll stand up in the temple and announce that he is God, the very God of gods. In so doing, all he's going to do is substitute himself for Jesus. In other words, he's going to pose as the man whom we think of as our Redeemer. But at that time, the world will be so ignorant of these things, they'll accept him as the Redeemer, as the Messiah. Probably he will pose as the Son of God or God himself. Having said that, we go back to Zechariah chapter 12. Again, you have the price of redemption, the false price of redemption. You have the foolish shepherd, the hireling shepherd. He's called the idle shepherd. In the Hebrew, that word means worthless or false. The false shepherd that leaves the flock, the sword shall be on his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. His right arm and his right eye. The right arm in Scripture is always symbolic of power or authority. The right eye is symbolic of insight or wisdom. His arm and his eye. But more than that, I think it's a literal wound, at least in Revelation it seems to be. Now what follows that? Zechariah chapter 12. What immediately follows that discourse is a war, the prediction of a latter-day war. So let's look at this, chapter 12. <coughs> Most expositors refer to Zechariah chapter 12 as the little apocalypse. In other words, it's a miniature book of Revelation. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens, layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. Okay? When's that going to happen? The nations being in siege against Judah and against Jerusalem. I'd say we are seeing at least the leading edge of it right now. Anytime you read the news out of the Middle East, what are you reading? Hamas and Fatah and the powers of the Western Alliance, the Europeans, the United Nations. Even our own State Department has ordered Israel to what? Give up on Judea and Samaria. Just stop. Stop what you're doing and leave. And by the way, leave East Jerusalem as well, because that's going to be the new capital of Palestine. So we're already seeing this happening. 
Jerusalem is a cup of trembling. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's a cup of poison. A cup of poison unto all the people round about, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth shall be gathered together against it. This is going to be a progressive gathering. We're already seeing the leading edges of it. A moment ago we talked about Daniel's view. Daniel chapter 11 talks about the Antichrist trying to seize power in Jerusalem. And he goes up against the eastern and the northern enemy in order to do it. And they come against him twice, but he finally secures the holy mountain. And he sets the tabernacles of his palace in the holy mountain. After some initial <laughs> warfare, Jerusalem is going to be a burdensome stone for all people. Now, when it says all people, it means all people. The Battle of Armageddon, which you see in the 19th chapter of Revelation in its final stage, just before the second coming of Christ, takes time to develop. And the Battle of Armageddon is simply one of a series of battles that begin, I believe, long before the tribulation. They rage at various times through the tribulation. There's one in the middle of the tribulation, and there's one at the end of the tribulation. So when does Zechariah's battle take place? Zechariah 12, 3, In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. The fourth verse, In that day, saith the Lord, I'll smite every horse with astonishment and his rider with madness, and I will open mine eyes upon the house of Judah, and will smite every horse of the people with blindness. What does that mean? Well, if you're riding a horse and your horse goes blind, <laughs> you're in deep trouble. But I think this is figurative language because I think we've gone beyond the horse cavalry. We have the air cavalry now, all those Apache helicopters. We've got all kinds of cavalry. We've got cavalry that can come against you in a dozen different ways, including missiles and aircraft and high-tech devices of all sorts. And apparently, there's going to be an attack against Israel, and all those high-tech devices are going to fail. The invader is going to be struck with blindness. Verse 5, And the governors of Judah shall say in their heart, The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. Hmm. At this point, the leaders of Judah, the Jews, are going to get an idea. The inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be my strength in the Lord of hosts, their God. Hey, they say, these governors of Judah, maybe there is something to this God thing after all. Right now, Israel does not have what we would call faith in God. There is a godly remnant in Israel, but the Israelis are a very secular people, and they depend upon their own secular defenses. They're very proud of their army and of their uh, high-tech uh, capabilities, their nuclear force, and so forth. And they depend upon that, not God. But during this battle, the governors of Judah, in Hebrew, the word for governor is eluf. What it says is elufim hayahuda the secular governors of Judah. I talked to Gershon Solomon about this one time, and I said, who are these governors? And he said, these governors, term eluf, he said, literally refers to a secular leader, like a high-ranking military official, or it can refer to a member of Knesset, the people who are running the show in a secular way. These are not godly leaders. The word eluf literally means a secular leader. And so we know that we're talking about a situation such as exists in Israel right now. The governors of Judah do not trust the Lord. Take my word, they don't. You can study the history of modern Israel. And I've talked with people who fought in the 1967 war. They fought in the Israeli army. They don't give credit to God at all. Well, Gershon Solomon does, but most of them say it was our superior military skill that won us the victory. Here we see a turn. Verse 6, In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood, like a torch of fire in a sheaf, setting fire to the enemy. This is a battle, and I believe it's the first battle. 
It is the first battle in a sequence of latter-day battles. And I believe it perfectly correlates with the northern invasion, that is, Gog invading from the north with an alliance. And remember, in Ezekiel 38 and 39, Israel is the victor, hands down. And so here is the reason that Israel is the victor. In that day will I make the governors of Judah like a hearth of fire among the wood. The Israelis have nuclear capability, and by the way, they have field-grade nuclear weapons as well as the big ones. And like a torch of fire in a sheaf, they shall devour all the people round about on the right hand and on the left, and Jerusalem shall be inhabited again in her own place, even in Jerusalem. When the smoke clears, Israel will have full possession of Jerusalem. There will be no contest at that time. And this is during the build-up. There is going to be a period which I believe is seven years long. It culminates at the middle of the tribulation, which means it starts three and a half years prior to the tribulation. And that's what Zechariah is talking about. It's the period of time he's talking about. The Lord also, verse 7, shall save the tents of Judah first, that the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. In that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. And the house of David shall be as God and the angel of the Lord before them. It's going to be a divinely led military victory for Israel. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Again, this sort of sets the stage. Zechariah shows this pattern. Zechariah has talked about the potter's field, the rejection of Christ. He's talked about Judas. And he transitions from Judas into the Antichrist, they call the idle shepherd. Transitions from that into the battle of Jerusalem. And he says that Israel is going to be victorious in the battle of Jerusalem. That victory will set up a pattern that allows the Antichrist to fully come to power. Let's go to Jeremiah 30 and look at this same pattern. Jeremiah 30. Jeremiah 30 talks about the restoration of Israel. The word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people, Israel and Judah, saith the Lord. And I will cause them to return to the land that I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. So notice now, it's Israel and Judah. They are back together again. How long has it been since Israel and Judah were together again as a single nation? 722 B.C. was the last time. That's a long time ago. So we're talking about the future here when Israel and Judah will be back again. But when Jeremiah says, these are the words concerning the Lord that spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah, he's talking about all the tribes coming back. For thus saith the Lord, we've heard a voice trembling of fear, not of peace. Ask ye now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. This is the figure of birth pangs, which Jesus used as a figure of the period just prior to the tribulation when Israel would be experiencing a series of pains, growth pains. Ask ye now and see whether a man doth travail with child or have labor pains. Wherefore do I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail and all faces are turned to paleness. So the figure here is that this return to the land is going to be accomplished through a series of pangs. And the way birth pains work is you don't have a constant pain. You have a pain, and then you have a pause, and then you have another pain, and then you have a pause. The pains get closer together until the birth occurs. And that's why this figure is used. Verse 7 says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It's even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Remember back in Genesis 32 when Jacob crossed the river Jabbok at night on his way back into the Holy Land? 
And he was met by a man at midnight, and he wrestled with this man until daybreak. And this man turned out to be the angel of the Lord. And in the process of gaining a promise from God concerning the land grant and concerning Jacob's own prophetic destiny, in the process of wrestling with the angel, he was crippled. Well, that whole figure of Jacob wrestling with the angel at night is a figure that is later realized during the Great Tribulation when Jacob, who is Israel, Israel wrestles during the night and wrestles with God, I might add. They wrestle against God during the Tribulation period because during the first half, they receive the Antichrist as the true shepherd when he's really the false shepherd. During the second half, Israel has to flee for its life to a hiding place for three and a half years. That's Jacob's trouble. It's a dark night of the soul, but in the end, like Jacob, their wrestling will yield a permanent blessing. They're going to be crippled in the process, just like Jacob was crippled in the process, walked with a limp the rest of his life. And to this very day, the Jews remember the sinew of Jacob. But the sinew of Jacob that was shrunken is a figure for Israel battling against God. In fact, it's kind of an interesting thing about the name Israel. I was told by a native Israeli once, in fact, I asked her, what does the name Israel mean? She was a Hebrew grammarian, and I said, what does the name Israel mean in Hebrew? And she said it means two things, depending on how you interpret it. It means either for whom God fights, or it means who fights God. It has both a positive and a negative meaning depending on how you translate it. Israel is the one for whom God fights, but also Israel is the one who fights against God. They are a nation with a split personality. And this is the story of Israel, this split personality going down through the ages until it finally regains its identity. It shall come to pass, verse 8, in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke from off thy neck, and will burst thy bonds, and strangers shall no more serve themselves of him. Wow. I suppose that could be the Antichrist. But they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. Therefore, fear not thou, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel. For lo, I will save thee from afar, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and shall be in rest, and shall be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. Now, we can talk about all of chapter 30 of Jeremiah if we had the time. We don't. But I'm going to go right to the end of the last verse in Jeremiah 30. The fierce anger of the Lord, Jeremiah 30, 24, shall not return until he have done it, and until he have performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it. Well, I'm convinced we're living in the latter days right now. In the Hebrew, ba'akarit hayamim, the latter days. We can do a whole hour on the latter day. That's such a remarkable phrase. It appears so many times in the Old Testament. The latter days. In the latter days. In fact, what it says, it says, Ba'acharit hayumim bativ nanu pa. In the latter days, you shall know it. It's what it really says. In the latter days, you're going to understand what all this means. You don't right now, says Jeremiah, but in the latter days you're going to understand what all this means. That very same phrase, by the way, is used in Ezekiel 38, 16. Let's turn to Ezekiel 38 and conclude our study for this morning there, because whether you look at Jeremiah, Zechariah, Micah chapter 7, Zephaniah chapter 2, Obadiah, Joel, I don't care who you look at, you're going to find this pattern. And Ezekiel 38, of course, talks about the northern invasion, but look at 38.16 of Ezekiel. Ezekiel 38.16 says, And thou, and thou being 
Gog and the Northern Alliance. Thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. Ba'akarit hayomi. Same identical phrase. Same identical phrase in the latter days. I think we're living in the latter days right now. In the New Testament, the term last days is used. And in the New Testament, you see last days applied to the entire church age. John, for example, talks about these are the last days, speaking of his own time. Last days being the age of the church from the time of the resurrection of Christ until the rapture, or from Pentecost till the rapture, if you want to be technical. Those are the last days. But the latter days speak of the period just prior to this incredible development of tensions on a global scale that at a certain point in time break over into outright warfare. Right now it's just not a question of whether but of when this whole thing is going to pop loose. Ezekiel 38. The thing about Ezekiel 38 that's interesting is that it looks like today. It doesn't look like any time in the past. Ezekiel 38, 8, for example, talks about Israel, talks to Israel. After many days thou shalt be visited in the latter years. Now here's a slight variation. The latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword. Okay? When did the latter years begin? 1892, when the first Aliot, when the first Russians came, Russian Jews came back to Israel and founded Petatikva. And I mean it was worse than desert. It was bad. It was like the Mojave Desert and these people had nothing to eat, nothing to drink, and three tents and that was it. It was horrible. They came back in 1892. I think that that is the latter years described here. And after 1892, there was another Aliyah in 1895, and the one in 1897, and several others. And as the Israelis came back, they turned a desert into Southern California, basically. It became the fruit bowl for Europe. After many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come back into the land that is brought back from the sword. Well, whose symbol is the sword, by the way? Islam. The sword of Islam. Here's a nation that was under the jurisdiction of a caliphate for years and years and years since the ninth century. One caliphate or another. In other words, it was under the control of the sword until the first Zionist Congress, 1897, the Balfour Declaration of 1917, the UN Declaration of 1947, and statehood in 1948, the latter years. So Ezekiel's prophecy looks like today gathered out of many people which is against the mountains of Israel which have always been waste. Well, there you go. For centuries Israel was a wasteland, but it's brought forth out of the nations and they shall dwell safely, all of them. And again I've said many times, but it's worth repeating that that word safely is a translation of the Hebrew batach, which means to dwell with a false sense of security. That is the literal meaning of that term. And I, I have it on high Hebrew authority from people who speak Hebrew way, way better than I do. That that word batach, translated safely, should say, but is brought forth out of the nations, they shall dwell with a false sense of security, all of them. Which is exactly, by the way, what they're doing. Uh, that really typifies Israel today. Speaking of Gog, verse 9, Thou shalt ascend, come like a storm, thou shalt be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, many people with thee. This is prior to the tribulation, in my opinion. I think several years prior to the tribulation. Let's just say five years, just to be arbitrary, before the tribulation. Thou shalt ascend, come like a storm, it shall be like a cloud to cover the land, thou and all thy bands, and many people with thee. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time shall things come into thy mind. 
and thou shalt think an evil thought, and thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I'll go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely. The same word, batach, having a false sense of security. All of them dwelling without walls, having neither bars nor gates. It looks like today. And when you get to verse 13, Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, those would be the various caliphates and emirates of the Arabs, Sheba and Dedan. Sheba is the northern territory of the sons of Ishmael. Dedan is the southern territory. Sheba the northern, Dedan the southern. So that encompasses all of the Arab world. And the merchants of Tarshish would be the Western Alliance, England, America, Europe, etc. Shalt say, Art thou come to take a spoil? So even the battle lines look like today. And again, we have the word safely. In verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy, say unto Gog, Thus saith the Lord God, In that day, when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? So that sets it up. Again, prior to the tribulation, the Antichrist is not mentioned here at all. He's not a factor yet. In Revelation, the four horsemen of the apocalypse riding for us. Remember, he rides forth as a conquering one with the intention to further conquer, which puts this and the four horsemen at the same time period, and the Antichrist is not even a thought at that time. As you read on in this prophecy, Ezekiel 38, 17, Thus saith the Lord God, Art thou he of whom I have spoken in old time by my servants, the prophets of Israel, which prophesied in those days many years that I would bring thee against them? In other words, it's not just Ezekiel. It's many of the prophets have prophesied of the northern invader. And we've looked at some of them. Verse 18 shall come to pass. Now this is very interesting. It shall come to pass at the same time. When Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. This corresponds, I think, to the riding forth of the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Revelation. It's not quite the tribulation yet, not yet, but it's phase one of the battle. Phase two of the battle is seen in chapter 39 of Ezekiel, where the battle becomes global in nature. Magog, which is the land of greater Russia, used to be called the Soviet Union. Ezekiel 39.6 says, I will send a fire on Magog and among them that dwell carelessly in the isles. Now those would be all the continents. So at this point, the battle takes on a global scale. And they shall know that I am the Lord. But look at the verses that follow, 7 and 8. So I'll make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel. I'll not let them pollute my holy name anymore. The heathen shall know that I'm the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. The heathen being the Gentiles. Behold, and this is key right here, verse 8 of Ezekiel 39. It is come, and it is done, saith the Lord God. This is the day whereof I have spoken. So finally, at this point, the day of the Lord begins, right here. And it's exactly like it is in Revelation. You have the battle. You have the developing battle. You have all kinds of death and earthquake, famine, pestilence, who knows what all. But it's not the tribulation yet. In Revelation 6, that doesn't happen until the sixth seal is opened. So this thing opens in a progressive fashion. Ezekiel shows the same pattern. It starts with an invasion. The invasion develops to a global level. And verse 8 says, at this point, it's come, it's done saith the Lord God, this is the day whereof I have spoken. Verse 9, And they that dwell in the cities of Israel shall go forth, shall set on fire and burn the weapons, both the shields, the bucklers, the bows and arrows, and the hand staves and the spears, and they shall burn them with fire seven years. They do this in the land of Israel. And if we take this literally, which I do, the burning of the weapons of the enemy takes seven literal years. This means since Israel is only in the land for the first three and a half years of the tribulation, at the midpoint of the tribulation, they're scattered again. They're driven into a hiding place for another three and a half years. That means that this seven years begins three and a half years before the tribulation, which means that the battle of Ezekiel begins before that. Maybe as much as five or six years before the tribulation. 
But the one thing I wanted you to see before we go any farther is that there is a very distinct an extremely distinct pattern of development prior to the tribulation. Turn to Revelation and we'll close. In Revelation, you have a very well-known pattern. In Revelation, you have chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, talking about the age of the church. You have chapter 4 and chapter 5 showing the church in heaven. Chapter 6, showing the great battle opening up. Well, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to see the pattern all the way through the Old Testament. The pattern is church age, church in heaven, great battle, day of the Lord. And you see that over and over again. You see it in Zechariah, Isaiah chapter 26, Zephaniah chapter 2, you see just over and over and over. You see that pattern. I think we, right now, are visible in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. That would be the effective church of the latter days. I know thy works. Behold, I've set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, hast kept my word, hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I'll make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. One quick footnote. What's the problem of the church? The church is split right down the middle between that part of the church that believes that it will be taken to heaven prior to the kingdom age, and that part of the church which believes that it is the kingdom age. The great majority of theology today believes in replacement theology. It believes that the kingdom will go to the church, not to the Jews. It is that that is referenced here. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I'll make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Those factions of the church which claim the rights that have been granted to Israel are going to be set straight one of these days. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I'll also keep thee from the hour of testing, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. And that one, where Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, I think is a reference to the rapture of the church. Boom. Quickly incalculably swiftly. Hold that fast which thou hast. Let no man take thy crown. In other words, don't give up the faith. Keep the faith. Keep the blessed hope. Keep the fires burning. Don't give up and compromise what you believe because it's difficult. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. He shall go no more out. I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches.